welcome everybody to our last um, hackathon, Createathon for the Evil 2021 annual meeting. It's my pleasure to introduce Catherine Coleman and Terry Rhodes and myself as the facilitators for the session today. And without further ado, let's uh, jump right in and I'll hand over to Kate. So as Christina said, here we are for the field guide. And come on. Yeah. And here the three of us are. Terry, you're up next. A okay. Quick intro. <laughs> quick intro. Mm. Um, welcome, everyone, on behalf of AAC and you. Uh, many of you know I have officially retired, but I have a position as a distinguished fellow there con continuing and I'm continuing uh, very, very graciously at the invitation of ABLE with the, the board and the work of ABLE. And so I'm uh, also representing AAC and you now in this joint endeavor to uh, reconstruct and to expand, not reconstruct, but to build on the first edition of the field guide to something more spectacular that we'll talk about briefly. But, um, do you want me to go ahead and do more about the AAC and you or just leave it at that right now? Okay. Okay. A little more back, sorry. Okay. I well, will introduce myself first then. Yeah. Um, yeah. So hello, I'd like to acknowledge first that I meet you here on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people. Um, I'm here in Southeast Victoria uh, or Nam, Melbourne in Australia. Um, I had the great pleasure of working on the field guide with a group of really wonderful editors. And uh, I guess the role of bringing people together in Trello and Google Docs to do, I guess, what has been, at least for me, the largest collaborative piece of work that I have worked in or edited on before with over 60 authors coming together to not only develop the ideas for each chapter, but to meet each other and develop what could become the concise uh, thinking around each of the field guide chapters. So I work at the Grad School of Education and I work still in ePortfolio research, but more predominantly in um, digital pedagogies and practices and what that might look like for studio work and how portfolios fit into that space. And kia ora. my name is Christina Hopner and I live in Tevanganui Atara, commonly known as Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But as you can hear from my accent, I'm not a born Kiwi, but I'm a transplant from Europe and moved to Aotearoa um, about 11 years ago to work at Catalyst in the Mahara project team. And Mahara is an open source e-portfolio platform. And since then I've been on the team and also involved in the wider e-portfolio community and had had the pleasure to be one of the co-authors for a chapter in the field guide with a very nice international crew reaching from Australia to New Zealand to the United States. And um, for the past two years, I've also been a member of the ABLE Digital Ethics Task Force. Uh, I wanted to give you a quick itinerary for people who don't necessarily know the field guide. And as Terry said, it's a really important point in time, five years after the field guide, um, to have a think about what this did, what this is, and how it actually might be used more. Um, for somebody who works in a big research institute, it's one of those things that I have to continuously report on around citations. And it's not a well-cited product, but it is openly accessible, it's usable. Um, and what it does, like all field guides, um, as Trent Batson um, asked us to, you know, way back in 2015 when we started talking about this, was to actually put a, um, a pause and have a look at the field what was going on in ePortfolio, what um, was developing around practices and pedagogies and policies, and how might we actually create a field guide for people coming new to the space, but also have something very concise and very scholarly um, as short papers that actually introduced people to what the ABLE community, which is how this was done. It's a crowdsourced book um, to actually think about what that might be. So this is the itinerary of the book. Um, you'll see in the video, I do a quick run through each of the chapters. 
to me, it's one of the most important pieces of ePortfolio research because it does something quite different. It's research in practice developed by practitioners. So people working on the ground in ePortfolios who came together, many who didn't know each other, to actually form these 12 big um, concepts around what it is that those new to the field might actually require. Or for those of us who've been in it for some time to go back to different areas that we don't work in. Um, so, for instance, what learning analytics and the learner might look like in e-portfolios is a really important part, particularly for people um, maybe in different roles in universities or colleges who don't necessarily use analytics within their packages um, around portfolios, for instance. And so th this is a big collection. And I think the actual process is one of the, um, I guess, the not the most important, but one of the most relevant pieces for what a create -a like this might be. This was a crowdsourced um, design thinking development of a text. Um, it then came together across uh, EPAC, um, ABLE, AAC and U to actually develop a more broader comprehensive understanding of why ePortfolio field guide might be necessary. And then all of these authors who, who continued to give up so much time to develop a very tight, concise, pithy paper, which is very different to an empirical study that might look at one particular site um, or a, a larger kind of survey, that they were together coming together to tell their experience through their own um, practice. And to me, that's what a, a practice portfolio uh, community is about how do we actually share with each other what it is that we know and how might we give that to others which is you know what that moment in time was about and I think I'm going to hand over to Terry to do a bit more of a story around now what might be okay uh, thank you and um, this has been a again a, a collaborative effort from the beginning in terms of the um, um, conceptualization of it. Uh, again, Trent Batson was uh, leading ABLE at that time and um, invited people to come together and wanted to make it global. And the resource that came out of it, I think the collaboration really was about building community. And um, it worked, uh, as Kate was describing. People were meeting people, but we're at an inflection time now. Uh, ePortfolio has moved from what was on many places either non-existent or um, was a boutique effort, something that very much became a technology question in conversation. And this was an effort to really say, it's much more than that. And what we discovered at that look in time was how much had actually happened in different places. And the realization that um, we would be able to um, share and learn from each other. And so now that we've been through um, and are still in a global pandemic and learning and teaching has moved into a virtual environment big time, often very, very quickly in emergency mode, that we, we really feel that we're at an inflection point where we need to take a, the step back or at least the pause and look at what we have learned to reflect on what worked, what didn't work, what we learned, what, we, um, what didn't work because we learn through failure, we learn through things not working out as we had anticipated they would. And from that, again, collectively, as we move across institutions, multiple and different types of institutions in different settings of urban and rural, from poor locations to wealthy uh, institutions or organizations, to gather that experience, to reflect upon it, in good e-portfolio uh, practice and try to bring out <clears throat> where the field has come. It's not to redo the field guide because that is indeed something that was fairly exhaustive at the time, but to move us now forward 
and to make it more accessible as well. We have a larger audience. We have a larger experience that's there. More and more people have become aware of uh, digital learning and digital instruction and digital community. And what can we learn from that going forward? Because even where we, uh, I think perhaps maybe over hopefully, uh, as um, Kate was describing, lockdown, open lockdown kind of thing, that we, we will get beyond where we have been. But this morning I read about a new strain called Lambda that is emerging, that is even more um, rapidly spreadable than the Delta version is and so on and so forth. So we're not gonna be back to the old times of everything in person instruction, back in a classroom, back in that setting exclusively. Digital learning, digital teaching, digital community is there. And we have the opportunity now to reflect on it, I think, and to help build toward the future of what we, how we can help mold and guide moving forward from what we have learned to make it a rich, rich experience for all of our students, cognizant of accessibility, cognizant of wealth disparities, cognizant of issues of equity across race, gender, et cetera. So we want this to also become an open educational resource much more than it has been in people's awareness by bringing the new folks in, learning from their experience and its limitations, as well as building on the expertise and experience that we have from the first version and how those folks have um, grown and learned through this process as well to bring that together. And so AAC and you, along with ABLE, are uh, going to be publishing this in the sense of formality, but also uh, helping to work together to um, look at how we can do a better job of of letting people be aware of it, making it usable for them, and having this incredible research and plethora of people as well as materials and examples for uh, enhancing teaching and learning globally. So uh, we're delighted that you're here and we're really looking forward to hearing from you in a few moments as we move forward and strategize about how to do this. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Kate, can you please move to the next slide? And uh, Terry already provided us with a good roadmap for the for the next um, 40 minutes. And so all I would like to say now is that we, we basically have two activities prepared. One is where you can reflect on your own practice, um, you can choose whichever time frame you like if you have already been in the e-portfolio space, but maybe you wish to concentrate on the last year that might have seen most of the innovation, especially also bringing e-portfolios more to the forefront and um, conversations that I've had with people, for example, that instead of going to online exams and doing lots of that type of assessment, they've actually turned to ePortfolios in order to see, well, how can the ePortfolio help us there when everybody is remote, has technical challenges, um, there might not be enough computers in the family to sustain everybody for an entire day. And so what can be done to continue with learning and teaching and also share experiences and reflect on what has been going on? So that is Part of our first activity and then we'll also think about um, at the same time think about what can the field look like in 10 years and you have the chance to right and and Kate will introduce both of those activities uh, just in a second to you and so you will have the chance to type your your answers to both um, to those two questions into the chat but if you would like to use the mirror board that we had set up, um, it's a collaborative space where you can pretty much use sticky notes, um, almost if, as if you were writing on paper and just putting them onto a whiteboard. Um, you can write directly on the mirror board as well and then 
put connections to them, but we'll also monitor the chat and move any statements from there onto the mirror board um, ourselves so that you can work with the chat if you prefer that one. So over to you, um, Kate, to introduce the activities. Beautiful. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I think these two things align for me. I've been using Miro a lot during um, 2020. So we're a, a year round school year in Australia. So from January to December, I was locked down from March. So and I teach um, future teachers. So Miro actually became a collaborative portfolio for us. Um, you'll see once you open the Miro link, if you haven't been to Miro before, that you basically have, um, it comes from the design world and I teach design teachers. So you have, you know, a very large wall in the design world in what we would normally do with pinups. But when you actually start pinning up evidence of work um, as collaborators and allowing students to peer review and to self-review their work against others, the portfolio pedagogy actually just picks up into a new technology, not developed as a portfolio practice, rather as a site for thinking, for ideation and prototyping. And so it let us do some of the what, what have you been doing, which is the question um, that we ask you first. Um, and your introductions, thank you, have started to do some of the introduction to the field. But it'd be lovely to have a think about now in that first question, what is it that you've been doing around e-portfolios? And to maybe broaden the idea, because often what brings you to portfolios is that somebody finally gives you a bit of language for what your pedagogical practice actually already is. So how have you been working during this time? Maybe not back years, but thinking about what this COVID normal era might look like. Um, and what have you been doing maybe in your own institution? What have you been doing with faculty? What have you been doing with students, depending on your role? And then the second question asks you to, to move forward for 10 years. Now, that's actually a really difficult thing to do, but something that Christina and Terry and I have only just recently done is go, okay, so what was I doing 10 years ago? And then have a think about all of the things that changed in that moment in time to think about how you might do your future work. Future imaginings are kind of difficult to work out. Um, but if you can think about what that might look like, so... And a visioning statement, I guess, is a, is a way to position that. What, what do you want or what do you need or what do you imagine portfolios to look like in that 10-year space? So what are you doing now? And then what do you need it to look like? Knowing that, at least in um, my world, they're talking for the next nine years that COVID uh, is in our world. Um, and so our institutions are going to have to change our practices and policies and the ways that we see what teaching, learning and assessment look like will need to change, including workplaces, depending on how we think about institutional portfolios. So there's your two bits of thinking and a bit of private time to do that reflective work and to use a process um, that we use in portfolios a lot to sit and think in that reflection and then to share your ideas. Um, and you can see how Miro works. It's a pretty magical board if you haven't used it in your teaching or learning before. Um, stickies are very easy. You can draw all over it if you grab the um, arrow tool and connect things if you want to start to do some of the metacognitive work of joining thoughts together. And if you just click on the board, you'll just get a straight big sticky. You don't even have to go over to the menu uh, and collect anything. You can also add a comment, which is the little comment bubble box. Uh, or just draw all over it if you really want to. Um, but it's a good place for us to archive uh, the thoughts that come out of today. And so you'll now have um, 15 minutes for this. So we'll be, or 14 minutes. So we'll be meeting back uh, 40 minutes past the hour. And really on your own reflect. So this will be a quiet activity. Reflect on, on the past which you can then add a sticky notes directly on the mirror board. Or of course, you can also type into the chat if you prefer, and then I'll transfer things over. And about halfway through the time, we'll let you know that you then might want to move to think forward. What do you want the field to look like in 10 years? And those of you that have joined um, us 
while we were already looking onto the mirror board, um, I'll just post the link into the chat again. And you're welcome to add your sticky notes to the uh, to the board yourself or use the chat. We are currently looking back at the field over the last year or longer and uh, would like to know from you what have you been doing or what also has changed over the last year in particular. And then we look at, well, where do we want to go 10 or where, where do we want to be 10 years from now? So doing a visioning exercise. And um, we use the field guide as our basis and want to build on top of it and see where we, where we can take the field itself. As you can see on the mirror board, it is like an every regular sticky note um, activity that everybody is just posting their thoughts and then we can group them if we like. And now that we have roughly at the halfway mark of our individual work activity, please do take a look at the think forward question. What shall portfolios look like in 10 years? Where do you want portfolios to be? What's your vision for the future? So if you can take a few minutes, please, and um, add your thoughts there, that would be fantastic. There's also in Miro, if you haven't used it before, the little three dots at the end of your nav bar on the left hold all of the things that you can do uh, on the Miro board. And one of those includes emojis. So if you'd be able to go back and like um, different types of thoughts on there is also a pretty cool way to add because somebody might have already added something that you might have added on your own. There's uh, lots of activity going on and lots and lots of fantastic ideas that you've shared. So we'd like you now to take um, four minutes to have a quick look through the sticky notes on both sides, the past and also the future. And just familiarize yourself with what the what your fellow participants have written. And as Kate mentioned, please feel free to click on a sticky and you should either already see the smiley or click on the three dots icon if you can't see it then and select the emoji. And there you can add a quick reaction to each sticky note if you like to do so. All right, if you've had a chance to, to read some of the reactions and um, activities mentioned or ideas for the future, um, what, has, uh, what have you seen? Is there a common thread? Um, are there some ideas that had been repeated? What was the most striking for you? And please feel free to use the Zoom chat or unmute your microphone to let us know. And of course, Kate and Terry, also please feel free to unmute yourself. Well, I'll, I'll jump in briefly. I, I am struck with uh, the learning uh, during this current time of the growth or the recognition of, of community and collaboration as being valuable when we're in isolation and adjusting to an isolation to a, I'm here on my own, the stark terror and annoyance of having to deal with something that you could have avoided if you were in person. Um, but that it was a, not just a lifeline, it was a, it seemed to be a, uh, an opening. People, more and more people were seeing collaboration and community as an opening and a support and a positive. For, um, for themselves and others. I, I saw that in the reflective piece of this for now. There's also, which is that someone's post-it note is about it already, but there's a, there's a recognition that we understand uh, a range of different capabilities through different tools that did emerge, you know, lots of... Um, Edupreneurial companies, lots of lots of institutions also realized that maybe they needed to do a bit of purchasing. Um, and my own note on there is now I, we now have uh, all Australian universities with an e-portfolio vendor agreement 
that only occurred in 2020. So there's been a shift around um, te technologies and how they might assist us to do this kind of teaching, which is quite different. Um, the entire um, added value and importance of digital literacy um, generally comes through for me, not only in terms of how people were able to accommodate the move to remote operations, but clearly it's future importance. Um, and I'm not sure about the other folks in the room, um, but I find most of my undergraduate students remain relatively digitally illiterate. Um, and e-portfolios, and we all get, I get, you know, e-portfolios are not about the technology, but it's a transferable skill. How's that for vernacular? So I do think that this idea of enabling the development of digital skills and being able to create a narrative or what I increasingly like to say, a brand within digital space that uh, is curated I think will be um, important and seems to be evident among uh, these sticky notes. Mm -hmm. It's a great collection that we have sitting here. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who jumped on and typed fast. Uh, it is a really lovely way to actually do any kind of mapping activity um, and, and to then archive, which is, you know, really how the field guide was created in its earliest days and then ended up on a Trello board, which kind of ended up doing a little bit like this um, kind of practice in the first place anyway. I guess it's a good segue into thinking about the um, what might be from here. Um, like the earliest days of bringing the field guide people together, it was about Okay, so we've got this idea. Now, how do we do it? Um, and that I don't know that one. <laughs> Alexa also doesn't know the answer. Sorry, <laughs> she seems to know most answers in my house. Um, how how are we actually going to develop the what the next field guide might be? And this is why this visioning around the ten years was important for us. The field guide, as Trent, you know, had posed to us at that time was literally like those bird guides. They are about things, birds that sadly are extinct. They're about new finds and new sounds and new, um, new places to go. And so what does the next field guide for us need to, need to do? What do we need the field guide to achieve for us? And Terry positioned it so well around um, open educational resources and open access. So this already is an open access book. Um, it's available for you to use wherever, whenever, and cite however you need to. Um, it's not behind a paywall. One of the things that we, we vision, at least, is what open education resources might look like that attach to either this field guide or attached to a new one? And is there a place for a new field guide? Is there a place for not a second volume? Because that's not how field guides work. They are redrafted and rethought and reimagined for the field. And so what does the field need in a COVID normal? And what does a COVID era portfolio field guide look like? What might it achieve? Um, and how might we actually think about the resources that we need? So there's two big questions. What do we need to do to reach that vision? And then what resources do we need? Um, the, it, it needs a large group of people because, you know, that's the way that you bring those things together. But it also needs a, a commitment from people to think about what that might look like and how we go and grab the people that we need to come in and work on it with us. Um, and so we're putting it to you because we think that there is a need, but the three of us can't do it by ourselves. <laughs> we kind of need a, We had 65 people last time. Um, yeah, it, it needs a collective and then it needs the collective to actually get behind it and think about how we might go about generating a new crowdsourced digital space. So I'm going to open it for an answer from somebody or a thought. Is it necessary? I think it would be good to have a second field guide or do more thinking around it because when we take a look at the topics that we had in the field guide. Um, some of the things that are now also on the board are not that mentioned yet. For example, mental health 
and well-being and also digital ethics. So I think there can be some lovely new additions to it. And also in conjunction with the digital ethics task force, where we've also been thinking about doing um, OER resources or providing some more guidance on how to use the, the principles so that there can be a nice um, crossover of things. Yeah, I, I think too that it's still an issue getting these resources out to people because even places that have had e-portfolios but just they just don't seem to be taking off um, are not aware of all these resources, both the field guide and the digital ethics. I, I, you know, I don't know the solution except to um, more marketing, more connections with other larger conferences um, to let them know about these resources, to link to them. It is the dilemma of the digital. Uh, and like Andrew says about digital literacies, one of the things that the ePortfolio community often does is use its digital sites to share these resources. Um, so how do we, I think something that sits underneath that is how do we actually enable and build the digital capabilities for um, digital communities of practice so that this can work? Because we can't get into institutions and, and at least... Uh, you know, for Australian academics, we will, our borders internationally are closed for the next two years. We won't be at conferences. And so we need to actually think about what digital communities of practice look like, how we build the digital capacity of people. So what do, we have ePortfolio Twitter chats continuously, and that's often where that community of practice lies. And so are there other ways for us to do this kind of thing as well? Might, might be a way for us to think about how we might share um, resources like this. And I have an eye on the clock. And so, Christina, perhaps you might want to jump in about one of the ways in which people can, before they have to log off, can continue to, to communicate and, and give us ideas and stuff. Yes, definitely. Um, Kate, can you please share your screen? Because my internet connection or computer connection is currently quite, quite low. So we, we've been thinking of, of course, how can, how can people get in touch with us? And so instead of needing to know three email addresses or sending it to one person and not the other, and then replies not coming back and things getting, getting um, lost somewhere, we established an email address that is very easy, fg.able at gmail.com, that um, the three of us have access to. And so we'd like to invite you to send your suggestions or ideas for collaboration, um, follow up questions to that email address. Uh, but of course, you're also very welcome to use our own personal addresses if you already have them to get in touch with us because we'd definitely like to keep that conversation going both with the ABLE board as well as AUC and U because as Terry had said in the beginning, AUC and U is uh, making major changes to its web presence and uh, what resources to provide, what initiatives to be involved. And so we definitely want to see how we can bring the work from the ABLE community, where there is a lot of overlap with the AUC and U community, just thinking even about the ePortfolio session at the annual meeting, um, and, and how we can collaborate with people around the world like you, your colleagues, please feel free to um, pass the email and also the presentation along. And then of course, also the recording, if you have colleagues in your own institutions or in neighboring institutions, whom you think would be wonderful to include in um, any future, future endeavors so that we can again, survey the field and have um, everybody as much as possible sitting at the table. Yes, the invitation is open. <laughs> Join us to have a think about what this might be. I think the might be and the what if are good questions to think about for the field going forward. And feel free to share this link with others, the email with others so that uh, we, the more the merrier. And so we'd very much like to thank you to, uh, for coming along to our session on the last day of the EGLE conference. Mm -hmm.